Um, and everything, universally, is a data problem, including usability, maintenance, debuggability, et cetera. Every, everything is a data problem. It's not a code problem. Uh, and solving problems you probably don't have uh, creates more problems you definitely do. Um, so avoid adding problems to the space that you, you don't have. And you know what problems you have because you have analyzed the data. The bad news, as always, is that good programming is hard, and bad programming is really, really easy. Um, so truths are that hardware is the platform, the reality of what we're working with. Um, that we design around the data, uh, not an idealized world. Um, that our main responsibility as programmers is to transform data. We solve that first, not the code design. So let's bring it all back to C++. Um, good. The good is that we generally have enough tools to reason about the most important part of the problem, memory and the data. We have access to it. We can reason about it. We can move things around. Um, the bad news is we generally also have a culture that thinks ignoring the real problem uh, is a good thing. More and more things get piled on uh, in order to hide how memory is accessed, in order to hide how memory is arranged, in order to hide by far the most significant problem that we deal with. Um, and while we're on the subject of the culture of C++, I would like to end with a quote from Krista Erickson, who is the former, now former, director of technology at Sony Santa Monica. Um, and if you haven't read it, the author of Real-Time Collision Detection. Uh, design, patter design patterns are spoon-fed material for brainless programmers incapable of independent thought who will be resolved to producing code as mediocre as the design patterns they use to create it. The end. Look at deep object hierarchies and that kind of design, yes. you know, and then sort of imagining in my head what, what that design looks like. <laughs> um, what happens is um, you're hiding so much valuable information and you're creating so much not valuable information, sort of adding yes. to the problem, right? Um, that you're making the problem more complicated than it is. And when you have a bunch of people, a hundred people, you know, a thousand people all making the problem more complicated than it actually is. Um, it's orders of magnitude, ultimately, um, of just bullshit that you have to get through to get to the, what you actually need to do. Yes. A, a more bullshit, right? Um, and that, I think, is problematic. Like, it's actually going to be more brittle and harder to understand and more difficult to change and more difficult to test. And pretty much any measure that you would want is going to be, it's going to be poor performing um, than the equivalent, you know, and you don't even know that it's equivalent sort of data-oriented model, but just the equivalent simpler model, right? Right, just reduce the level of that yeah. abstraction as much as you could have instead of thinking that you were adding some benefit by making things more, more removed. Right, I think adding, I mean, and this is the thing that I disagree with a lot of people on, is that adding stuff to the problem does not make the problem simpler. Um, it never makes the problem simpler. It always, adding something always makes it more complicated. Um, so you want to find the, the absolute minimum amount that describes the solution that you're dealing with, or even the problem, right? This is the minimum set. This is the minimum thing, um, and that's what your, what your solution is, right? That's what you're dealing with. As soon as you start adding, even just adding small models that are in your head, like I'm thinking of the problem in this way, this way. that's something that you're now adding to, to the problem space. And now somebody else is going to come and read it, and that they have to reinterpret this model that you had in your head on top of what the actual problem is, um, and that's going to cause confusion, and it's going to, you know, and this is why, you know, this is why they say one of the difficult problems in programming is naming, um, oh. because by naming something, you are introducing oh, a preconceived so you, notion. Yeah, you are introducing problem space. So you're introducing your mental mental model to the space that just doesn't exist there having a very clear input and output, right? The, the input is the, this, you know, the controls, right? The, the, your physical input. The output is um, Tommy smiles, right? That's this is very clear <laughs> input-output scenario, right? Um, and uh, the, the answer to that is the, the stuff that you came up with, right? Is that, that, it's not garbage, it is the right answer. It works, right? It's, it's the appropriate response. The way you did it, sort of testing it and iterating on it, and, and it doesn't matter that there's not a name, you know, you had to create a name for, you know, twisting physical whatever in the air, you know, it doesn't, but it doesn't matter that it's not real, right? It doesn't matter that it doesn't fit the model. I think you, you probably lost time by thinking that it should have fit the model. 
And I think coming back and, and now even reflecting on it and still using the word, say, garbage when you're, when you're referring to it, um, sets the wrong message. It's in fact the opposite. It's exactly the right thing. Garbage would have been trying to make it real, right? Because it wouldn't have been fun. That kind of gets a, a sort of, an, I suppose, an interesting mentality there that's uh, true for a lot of stuff, which is just there's a notion of that there is some, like, you know, uh, proper programming, elegance, something, blah, 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 and then if you're not doing that, you kind of have to couch your statement about what you did. Like, if you're not using a real physics engine simulating all of this stuff or whatever, you have to call it a garbage formula so that people don't say, oh, you don't know how to program, you're just doing these, like, hacky formulas or something. But it kind of sounds like what you're saying is, like, no, no, no. Like, the problem is to make this thing do what it's supposed to do, and whatever is the correct solution to that is, is the best programming you could have done, basically. Yes, if, it's the, the if it's, the, it's, the, it's the simplest solution that solves exactly the problem that I had. Yeah. That's the right answer. Yeah, sure. yeah. Anything else yeah. is yeah. fucked up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> why would I do anything else? Um, I have a plan B in case my solution to my current problem doesn't work. So I get, some, get to the end of the project, We'll get to a demo, I have to deliver something for E3 or GDC or whatever, and it's two days before, of course, and everything is broken, and I have to say, okay, I have to give up and say, whatever I was currently working on wasn't going to work, I have to get that plan B in there, I have to figure it out. Um, I didn't have a plan B, so now I'm scrambling to try to figure it out and blaming everybody else, blaming project management or whoever put this on the schedule or all the things, I'm very angry, and I'm trying to scramble for a plan B, but the thing is, I knew that the, like, the deadline was coming. I knew that, the, that this, there was potential risk here, and yet I didn't have a plan B in advance. I didn't prepare for it. Okay, that's a problem. On top of that, I have already implemented my plan B in case my solution to my current problem doesn't work. I know there's, this is risky. I know that when it comes right down to it in the last few days, I'm going to have to do something. Why didn't I just implement that thing in the first place? Uh, two things, right? One is, uh, one, it's a safety net, and everybody else can be confident. Because if you wait until the last minute to implement your plan B, you have just made, added stress to everyone on the team. Because they don't know if your plan B is going to work. So put the plan B in first. The second thing is, you implement your plan B up front, you probably discover half the time that that's good enough. Like, it does the job. I don't actually need to go to plan A. Or I discover something about my problem that I didn't anticipate at all, and plan A wasn't going to work. So put your plan B in first. I write a framework and have used it multiple times to actually solve a problem that it was intended to solve. So I could get into a rant separately about frameworks, which are the, usually an excuse to kick, down, kick a problem down the road to get somebody else to solve it. Uh, but let's, talk about, let's be generous and say you're building a utility of some kind that's actually useful. Um, have you actually verified that it does the job that it was intended to do, or are you just waiting for somebody else to do that? You can't, if you haven't actually proven it works, how, 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 is it, how is anybody else supposed to trust it? My experience, object-oriented analysis and design very quickly becomes analysis paralysis. If you take the ideology seriously as I did, you're going to waste a lot of time hemming and hawing about to conceptualize these elements of your program. Object-oriented programming is generally sold to students on the basis of these trivial examples that neatly model real-world taxonomy, but what we get in practice from object-oriented analysis and design is a lot of very abstract excess structure with no obvious real-world analogs. Note here that programmers have their own peculiar definition of abstract. When programmers talk about abstraction, they're generally talking about simplified interface over complex inner workings. What's odd about this is that in more general usage, Abstract has a connotation of being hard to understand. Something which is abstract has no resemblance to the things of common daily life. And it turns out that most things which programs do are abstract in this sense. And so it shouldn't be surprising that we have great difficulty conceptualizing the components of a typical program in terms of neatly self-contained modules, particularly modules which have any real-world analog. When we pollute our code with generic entities like managers and factories and services, we're not really making anything easier to understand, we're just putting a happy face on the underlying abstract business, and for every excess layer of abstraction, we're getting more abstractness. In attempting to neatly modularize and label every little fiddly bit that our program does, we're actually just making our program harder to understand. Something that happens all the time when I look at object-oriented code bases is that I'll try and find the parts in code 
that correspond to some user visible functionality. But trying to find the functionality going by clues from the names of classes and the names of methods tends to be very misleading. Very typically, my expectation that functionality X would be in the class named X turns out to be wrong because the abstract nature of what we typically do in programs generally necessitates that functionality is not going to be self-contained. It's not going to neatly fit into one neat module. And so the class which is called X will very superficially relate to X, but then all the real work is done elsewhere, scattered throughout the code. This makes me question, what is the value of having a class called X if it doesn't really contain all the business of X? What this class X really represents is actually misleading code structure, and how is that helpful? How is that conducive to understanding of your code base? The other reason I have this problem reading code bases and trying to track down where functionality actually lives is because object-oriented design tends to fracture functionality in our code. It tends to take what otherwise could be relatively self-contained code and split it up into many separate methods across many separate classes, typically often in many separate files, for God's sake. This fracturing is accepted because of an ideology about encapsulation and this notion of classes and methods properly having so-called single responsibilities. And there are certainly valid arguments for that idea. Certainly it is much easier to get a small short function correct than to get a large sprawling function correct. But the important question is that in splitting our code up into many little small methods and to many separate classes, are we actually decreasing the total complexity of our program or just displacing the complexity, just merely spreading it around? In either case, there's this attendant trade-off we're making where by splitting up larger units of code into many smaller ones, we're greatly increasing the, the so-called surface area of our code, where I come along and I look at your code base and I try and get a foothold and everything's split up into these tiny little units, these tiny little packets of code. Reading this kind of code often feels frustrating in the same way it can be frustrating to eat a bunch of little candies that are all individually wrapped. And when all your methods are really, really short, you end up having to jump all around the code to find any line of logic. A lot of business that otherwise could be neatly sequentially expressed in longer methods gets artificially split up. So it feels like you've taken a neatly sorted deck of cards and thrown them into the air so you can play 52 card pickup. Like what I would say is, write the editor and then write the plugins or whatever, write the functionality, make all the functionality work. And then if you're dispatching between them with an if statement and it feels kind of hacky and you need more abstraction for a very concrete reason, then put in a function pointer. But I wouldn't even do that. I would just have an if statement that turns them on or off for a long time because it's, it's actually a relatively, that part, of writing an editor is so small and so minor in terms of what it solves that I wouldn't even bother for a long time. Um, on the other hand, if you buy into a weird structure or many weird structures, which is what happens in order to preemptively solve this very small problem before it becomes a problem, you end up taking on all these very large belief structures that are actually very hard to conform to. And you have to conform to those belief structures all the time because that's what, that's what you made your program be. And it actually gives you a much bigger job to do than you actually have to do to solve the actual physical problem that you have in the objective world, all right? So that's, that's the, the best thing that I can say about this. Like literally though, my advice about programming very generally is it's fine to know about all these things that people say about how to structure a program, but if you don't have a program yet, you don't have a structural problem to solve yet. So first make sure you have a program that does something interesting. <laughs> and then if you need to solve something, you can refactor it to solve that problem. But most of these things that people say, they're not good.